Mark Bridges, you've collaborated yet again with Paul Thomas Anderson, this time on Licorice Pizza, uh, but it's not the first film you guys have made that's set in the 70s. You've got Boogie Nights and Inherent Vice, but they're all vastly different films set in different years. So how did you approach this one, this coming of age uh, story in 73 San Fernando Valley? You know, when I work with Paul, I just try to be as specific as possible uh, to the year, time, and place. And so, you know, our other 70s projects were, were different. You know, 1970 for Inherent Vice, so that there was more uh, references to the 60s fashions. Um, in Boogie Nights, that started in 77, which was very different from 70. And so, um, you know, we looked at a lot of yearbooks, we looked at primary research from the period and tried to find what were the specifics of that period. And um, whether it's the length of a skirt, width of a collar, um, you know, you think of flares and bell bottoms as being 70s. But uh, actually, we were still in the early 70s, we were still in a transitional stage where it was more common for women to wear the flares and the men were a little slower to take up that fashion. Whereas in, the, in Boogie Nights, it was all flares all the time. So even little things like that give us specific time and place. And um, then we're able to make that story. And I knew Paul wanted it to seem very real and so, uh, you know, we looked at just a lot of candid photographs from that period as well. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it, the film is also inspired by Gary Goetzman's uh, life. So did you look at like some of his like personal photos? Uh, were you like supplied with any of that? I was uh, actually, I think Gary was a little older in the period that we were doing. But every once in a while, I would check my phone and there would be another Getzman family photo sent to me by Paul. So I would be, oh, okay, this is great, you know, that, you know, to get the flavor of his mom or to get the flavor of uh, actually Gary. But, you know, he was a, a little older than the way we have done it in the film at the time. But uh, I think that kind of candid quality of the photographs also just helped me understand what Paul had in mind for the look of the film. Mm -hmm. um, what surprised you the most, I guess, from your research of that specific era in, in that place too? Cause they're, you know, 70s all over the country and the world, like the styles were different as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think I was most surprised by how uh, how much of th those photographs from 1973 in the yearbooks looked modern in a way, um, because we've all at this point sort of co-opted that vibe from the 70s, you know, um, uh, Converse All-Stars, uh, a kind of a band sneaker, um, a slim pant for the men, um, jerseys, you know, there's a lot of retro stuff out there right now. I was surprised at how accessible even using the real clothes were because it's so common in our vernacular now. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you go about sourcing the clothes versus uh, making them on your own? Like, What was like the, the percentage of each? Right. Usually when I start a film and the way Paul and I work actually is, you know, we will talk concept, we'll look at research photographs, and then I'm really anxious to go and put my hands on real clothes. And we're very fortunate here in Los Angeles to have a lot of co costume rental places that have been collecting clothes for a hundred years, you know, so I can go in there and it's like an archive that I can put my hands on, I immediately look for clothes that have the character of a person or uh, has a certain look. And <clears throat> excuse me, um, we will uh, then put our hands on the clothes. I'll think, oh, this would be great for Gary. This might work for Alana. And then we, so I'll pull a lot of things. I'll, uh, when I know that I want specific things, once I have a first fitting or two, 
Um, uh, then I will start looking on Etsy and eBay and dealers and vintage stores and things. But right now I'm, I'm so fortunate here in Los Angeles to have six or seven costume houses that I can go into a section that says, you know, men's 1970s short sleeve shirts and, and just see what talks to me, what speaks to me, what says, oh, this is Gary, or this might work for uh, Alana, you know? And so I'm very fortunate that way and I'll bring it all to a fitting and we'll try things on and I'll show Paul photos and it'll be yes, no, no, yeah. It's better that we all are looking at the same thing rather than talking about clothes because you and I might be talking about a little black dress, but we have two visuals that are in our minds, you know? So Paul and I always look at the pictures and with an actor in it, and I, and I try to have a very plain background. And when I do a fitting too, I try to um, do it in order, the character's arc, um, so that it's easier for all of us to visualize how it might work in the screenplay. Mm -hmm. Um, so one thing I love about the outfits uh, is that they all feel very fresh and naturalistic, kind of like what you were saying before about the vibe of the film. Mm -hmm. um, but I was also thinking like, I mean, in my mind, the 70s are only 30 years ago, but now it's actually 50 years ago. So I was yeah. wondering, <laughs> like when you're, you know, trying to source like these vintage clothing from these custom houses, like, and you find them, like, do they look old? And then you have to... I don't know what you do, like process them yeah. to make them no newer, oh, I, or you like redesign yourself. It's funny you say that. Yeah, because I I have, when I've put my hands on the real clothes, you know, we're looking for shape and vibe and everything. But if I'm getting a pair of 50 year old jeans, 50 year old denim, they look 50 years old and I want them to look like they just came out of Chess King or whatever. So we will find a prototype shape and then we will remake it. You know, we will remake what we need. And, um, excuse me. And um, it, it, that's how we did a lot of it. You'll source, luckily there are a few places who ha still have vintage fabric for us to use um, over the years. Of course it's going, but oh, yeah, I've been really lucky even on this one to find vintage fabrics still around. Um, you can buy vintage fabrics on Etsy they still make things like brush denim and certain twills and things like that. So um, it's always it's always a great treasure hunt to try to find fabrics to make new, or there are some vintage dealers now who still have what they call dead stock, which was never sold in when it was first out. So it's like unopened. Yeah, and I will get things that still have their manufacturer's label on them and the price tag for ridiculously, you know, two ninety eight dollars for a pair of pants or something, you know, which is, <clears throat> if only, right? If only that were the way. But so it's a, a real treasure hunt and that's part of the fun and, and you get a big charge out of like finding something either fabric or uh, an unused garment or something that really works. So yeah, you, you want to have things seem like they came from the mall, not in the you know, far past, but, but recently. Although Paul very much likes things to look very lived in too. So sometimes when we find vintage that's in good condition, then it, it's the right, right patina for Paul, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the film is really about Alana's character trying to find herself and self-discovery. And, uh, you know, she's like testing out these different jobs and relationships. And you see that in her clothes as well, too. Like she wears, uh, you know, that like sleeve dress to that audition. And then she has that bikini halter top. Uh, so she doesn't really have like a specific style, but that's also kind of a, a style in and of itself. So how did you go about designing her closet? Yeah, well, that's funny you use the word closet because that was part of the thing is, you know, <clears throat> let's figure out who this character is and uh, make her a closet. Also, you know, she has two sisters. So I felt you could, there could be things, I, I think I did it may have ended up on the cutting room floor where you see something on one sister and then Alana's wearing it later. So, which seems kind of real girl, you know, 
I understand they borrow each other's clothes. <coughs> and, um, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, but then also I tried to find things that looked good on her. Cause of course, hopefully we all have things in our closets that look good on us. But that doesn't mean there's a particular style. And then she was more like occasion dressing, you know, uh, and a bit of a, a chameleon as far as what her choices were. So it also, it lent to that kind of awkwardness in a way. And she's constantly putting on and trying on <clears throat> new vibes, new looks, new her. Um, it, it, and, and it seemed to work really well. You know, you make X number of pair of pants for her that fit well or patch pockets or low rise or whatever. You, you make like the way we open our own closet and that way I can mix and match. And I've repeated a couple of outfits in the film. It seems like her important outfit was when she was Gary's guardian on the airplane on the way to New York and then she wears it again when she begins working for Joel Walks. So it kind of became like, I'll wear my good conservative outfit. And what she chooses to wear when she meets Gary at the restaurant is interesting too, because it looks good and it's a short skirt, but she's got the boots. It, it very much, I think, is... is an example of how on the fence she is about the whole thing. But then she comes home and her sister asks, like, why are you dressed like that? Did you have a date? You know, and she's like, you know, cut it, you know. Um, so it's it was really fun to decide what that was going to be, too. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about uh, both of their final outfits because uh, Gary is in this uh, very striking white suit and I think it's a pink shirt. And she is in this like green pattern, like button down dress. And, yeah. you know, spoiler alert, they uh, reunite, they run towards each other and it's, it's a big moment. So how do you go about picking the right looks for like the grand finale, so to speak? Mm. It's interesting. Um, <clears throat> I think, I think I rely on the script really, um, uh, you know, and, and Paul, of course, because he had requested that Gary have sort of his casino moment. <clears throat> um, for opening his pinball palace. And, uh, you know, I can't remember, the white suit might have been in the script or it might have been something that Paul talked about. And I was lucky enough to find that, an original suit purchased, it had a label in it from the Valley. Um, so it was exactly the kind of thing that Gary would have had access to and probably thought was amazing. Um, so <clears throat> a lot of times the script informs what how, what that is. So that that white suit was probably written in the script or something requested by Paul. Then I had, you know, I knew her time and place was that she was working for Joel Walks. And I had this very, it's kind of a unique looking eccentric Kind of a little ugly dress with the green and the plaid, um, but very of that moment, um, you know, ugly, beautiful is what I mean, you know, because it's sometimes I'll see things that are just outrageously bad, but they're so bad that they're great. And I wouldn't say that about this dress, but it is definitely uh, specifically that moment in time. So, and it, al it also kind of goes with the film. You know, there's a kind of uh, naivete and, and realness and awkwardness to it. And so I thought it was, it was right for that last leg of the film. And I think it works. I think it's very cute and it doesn't look too glamorous or anything or too planned even because you, you lived with her with that dress for a while through all the other goings on. And then lo and behold, this is how we finish the film. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a big dress person, but I was like, I want that dress. I want to, I want a lot of her <laughs> cute dresses. In there. Uh, isn't it funny how they're, they're kind of that and, and kind of fresh again, because mm -hmm. we haven't visited that style for a while, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. 
Uh, well, the other big uh, all white outfit is uh, Bradley Cooper's John Peters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how did you go about uh, creating that look? It's very interesting. Um, you know, of course, you're looking for uh, we're looking for research. We're looking for John Peters. He's, of course, who was well known at the time and still is, of course. But, uh, you know, you, you find images. And I had a few ideas of how he talks about he's going to the movies with Barbara. And, you know, I had one, there's a picture of the two of them together and he's in sort of a pattern shirt with a plaid jacket, jeans. It was very interesting. And then there's another photograph of him with, with Barbara with an embroidered white shirt. It's, it has a collar. It's not like the one we ended up with, but there's something, there's something about somebody who dresses all in white too, that, um, you know, you, you do a double take, you look a little askance at that, you know. Yeah, it's not the so, same as all black. <laughs> yeah, not at all, not at all. It's like you want to show off or you think you're hot stuff or whatever, which seemed like a good vibe for this guy, you know, and very much that moment in time as well. And California and, and uh, you know, there's a kind of conspicuous consumption with all white, um, you know, you can afford to have it cleaned or throw it away. Um, so we went with that image and I, and again, I, as I say, I collect a lot of real clothes and then we try them on and I'll take pictures and we'll show Paul. And um, this was, I, we had found this shirt at a rental house and then we found the trousers there. Of course, for filmmaking purposes, we had to remake them because we couldn't go through a very long sequence at night in white you know, for Bradley with one vintage mm -hmm. shirt that was like as thin as a Kleenex, you know. So um, my shirt, we lo everybody loved that image once we tried it on Bradley, the prototypes. And then we went on to make them. Uh, I have Anto Beverly Hills does all my shirts for me for films, whether it's 30s, 20s, 70s, whatever. Um, and they figured out the embroidery so we could do the embroidery on it. And then uh, my men's tailor made the trousers and um, I gave him some zip up boots because I thought that that would make him walk a little more cock of the walk. And, and that's like really sort of, you see like you know, the back of him and his feet before you see his face. <laughs> yeah. And so, so that, so, you're, you're always trying to help the actor and facilitate the performance. So sometimes you give them a certain kind of shoe, it makes them carry themselves a certain way. So that was kind of the trick uh, for that character. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, uh, the last time you collaborated with Paul, you won the Oscar for Phantom Thread, uh, but most importantly, you won a jet ski that night. Oh, yes. for this acceptance speech. Uh, and, you, and you came out at the end on this jet ski with Helen Mirren. So amazing moment. But what do you remember about that night? And I understand you also auctioned off the jet ski. So I, yeah. I'll get to that. <laughs> well, I remember that night, you know, uh, whenever you, know, you think about doing a speech, you're, you think like, let's make it quick. You know, nobody wants to listen to you, Yamaran. Um, and so did that. And then all through the night, they kept saying like, well, Mark Bridges still has the shortest speech. And, and when they finally came to me near the end saying like, Mark Bridges, come here. And I was like, oh no. Uh, so they took me to the green room, still waiting for other people's speeches. And then they lead me backstage and there is a jet ski and there's Helen Mirren. And so I remember talking to her and I said, I, I think I, I keep thinking of Gene Kelly and singing in the rain saying dignity, always dignity. And, uh, she, and Helen Mirren said, like, sometimes I like to poke holes in dignity. So I was like, mm, I think you have something there. So I put on the, the life jacket yeah. over my tux got up there they get, had my oscar and then i figured out how i was gonna do it. you just go with it you know what i mean you just go with it and when we went out there and i'm waving or whatever and paul i see paul thomas anderson in the audience cracking up so i knew everything was okay he was like hysterical 
So we knew it was fun. It was a joke. It was a gag. And you just go with it and you have fun. And then, yes, I did give the jet ski because I have no use for it at all or any good experiences with a jet ski um, to the Motion Picture Television Fund. And then they could auction it off because it's a great, you know, it's a organization made by people in the industry, for people in the industry. And uh, I, I felt they're a really worthwhile charity. So they were able to auction that off. It's, it's full circle. So, so maybe this year, you know, uh, if, if you're fortunate enough to be up again and they have give this incentive, would, would you, I, I, I remember you at the time you said you accidentally gave the shortest speech. So will you be more incentivized to like not win at this I, time? <laughs> you know what, at a moment like that, at a, I, and you know, that was kind of a Jimmy Kimmel gag actually, but um, at a moment like that, you're, you're so happy, you're overwhelmed, you've got a clock in the back of the room telling you to hurry up. Um, you know, there's a lot going on. I, I don't even know how I would feel. Uh, you never know until that moment. You know, I just wanted to get on and get off and look what happened. I iconic moment in Oscar history. So. Yeah. Uh, well, Mark, it was great speaking with you. Thank you so much for your time and congratulations again on another PTA classic. Thank you so much. Great talking to you.